Welcome to the Lunch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, it's a video gear rodeo. I'm talking with Lens Rentals onboarding supervisor, Ali Acock patterson and Lens pro to go video producer, Dom Boisfort, about which of our newest products they're most excited about. And it's not just cameras and lenses. The Lens Rentals inventory covers a lot of niche territory, so we're just as interested in switchers, gimbals, even batteries. It's been a while since we've done one of these, and there's a lot to cover, so here are Ali and Dom. Ali, Dom, welcome to the Lens Journals Podcast. Thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Howdy. Thanks for having me. The phrase is howdy because this is a new gear rodeo. Oh, howdy. Ollie. I don't know if Yeehaw. you've forgotten in the many uh, months we've taken off, but we call these things rodeos. Oh, I forgot about that. And Dom, that was pretty impressive for a Northeastern. <laughs> Thank you. A pretty good yeehaw. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Unlike both of us who are super used to saying yeehaw. The time. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sure you guys are just. I say it every Sunday at the buffet. Yeah. In Memphis, it's like a, a it's like aloha or shalom. It's just hello, yeehaw, goodbye, yeehaw. It means everything. So yeehaw to both of you yep. on the New Gear Rodeo. Uh, so yeah, what we're going to do here is each of you gave me a short list of new products that you want to talk about and I'm going to I'm going to kind of grill you on them and we're going to hopefully kind of cover some new video stuff that we've we've gotten in recently. And Ali, I'm going to start with you. You gave me this one and it might be a little dry to start off with talking about batteries, but I'm legitimately excited to talk about this. The uh, Anton Bauer Titan Micro, uh, which is kind of a new battery format from Anton Bauer. Can you tell me what makes this a little bit different than our like more traditional Anton Bauer 90 watt hour batteries? For sure. Specific to lensrentals.com as a rental house, it makes it possible to ship more power in the same form factor as, you know, like a standard Titan battery, uh, the 90 watt hour ones. So now you have these dual battery plate adapters where you can go from any camera running off of a gold mount or V mount battery plate, throw on the adapter and have two slots for batteries without changing the format. Or adding much weight. So basically, they're just little pocket-sized batteries that still pack the same 90 watt hours. And now you can double down and have 180 watt hours, and they're hot swappable. And doubling up the DTAPs and USBs. Oh yeah, I didn't consider that, but that would be true too. Yes, Um, which is hugely important. Um, I'm pretty sure they all have two DTAPs on them, anyways. But to have four is just like you'll probably never need like more than four. So yeah, for anybody listening, I don't know, they're super common, but just in case anybody who's listening who's not familiar with the like standard format, uh, 90 watt hour batteries, they're the size of a brick. Yeah. 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 That's really close. <laughs> I, I almost for some reason said a VHS tape, but they're, they're Maybe like a beta tape. Yeah. Yeah. They're a little bit smaller than a VHS. So, you know, they're about that size and these guys are same power output, but half the size so you can fit two on the same plate like ali said that makes them hot swappable which is awesome you can change batteries without turning your camera off you can also travel with them without having you know larger cases if you're used to having like a four pack battery kit as like a carry-on option in that same size case you're going to be able to double down on the number of batteries you have right we rent them in an eight pack rather than just a four or a six i assume for that reason we can just fit more in a case Mm -hmm. that's awesome And like we already mentioned, same power output, 90 watt hours. But one caveat, and I mentioned this specifically because I asked about this before we started recording, they do not enable 24 volt output. So there are some plates, uh, say with the Alexa LF, where you would need to put two standard size 90 watt hour batteries on to be able to run a single camera because... Or light, lots of lights these days. Yeah, the... Gemini two by one is another example. Anything that takes a lot of power at once. Sometimes you have to use two batteries at the same time. These will not power those sorts of accessories, right? I do not believe so. Okay. Since we're just like in battery land, and again, this is not a super new product, but something in the same sort of vein. Um, So these are the Titan micro batteries. We also have a different form factor, Anton Bauer Titan. That's a 68 watt hour battery with sort of a different uh, build. Titan base. Titan base. Yes, that one. 
can you tell me what the difference is between that and this? So the Titan base is designed to fit um, kind of between like your tripod head and your camera. It has a quick release plate with a quarter 20 mount on it. And then on the bottom, it's got quarter 20 threading. So it just kind of sits between them and you use a D-tap to power whatever camera you want. Wooden camera makes, you know, a D-tap cable for pretty much every matchable camera. Right. That is specifically geared towards people who are shooting with DSLR and mirrorless cameras, though. Not really so much uh, a good solution for like cinema cameras and full size camcorders. Right. That makes sense. So rather than connecting to a battery plate on, say, rails, you're going straight onto your camera. Right. I have I have a gripe with the tiny face. Oh, what is it? No, not a gripe. It's it's um so they advertise it really heavily with the Blackmagic Pocket camera, probably the 6K, which um has a power problem. It just sucks the power out of an LPE6. You need to bring 16 onto a shoot. And so that makes um it makes sense. I just um I would keep it in the studio. <clears throat> this guy's by like a lakeside with this huge like brick underneath the rails of this camera and I just don't see it being i would i would never use that on location like free like free handedly it just it's clunky it's it's um oh, sits just on like the bottom an ergonomic of your camera. thing yeah and you know what i do all the time when i'm shooting place the camera directly on the ground to get a level with the ground shot and um if something prevents me from doing that i you know gets a little annoyed yeah for sure it may not be the thing for you if you're going handheld a lot or especially working on like a gimbal or anything but then again i suppose if you're in the studio you probably got ac power and this is like a location sort of solution but, possibility too Ugh, i don't know maybe it's for people who don't want to have to change that lpe6 I, every 15 minutes i definitely don't and i agree that that it really is a solution batteries yeah. yeah you keep the one lpe6 for that on the ground shot you want and then use the titan base all the other times. <laughs> well, hey, speaking of black magic, guys, check this out. I'm segueing like a total professional <laughs> segue from one Do podcast it. topic to the other. Speaking of black magic, Dom sent in uh, the black magic ATEM Extreme ISO switcher and recorder. And my first question for Dom is for anybody who's not familiar. Could you explain what ISO recording is? What what features that adds to this recorder? Because this isn't necessarily yep. a new product. It's more of an update to a, an existing switcher. Yeah, it is. So there are a lot of products in this line. I think there might be like five of these switchers now. And um, in sort of typical like camera manufacturer fashion, they rolled out one model and then they rolled out another one and just tacked on ISO at the end of it. So it's like, what does that thing do? So it's actually really great. It's an 8 HDMI switcher, and what the ISO does is allows you to take it. It, it will record um, the full video signal from all eight of those HDMI's and make a whole file structure for you on an external drive with each input and everything. Um, and it's really, really great. Um, and I put that to use in a YouTube video I did for the channel where I basically demoed the. A10 Mini Extreme ISO. Such a mouthful. Everything they do is yeah. <laughs> such a mouthful. A lot of words. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll definitely put a link into that YouTube video because it's really helpful. I, I like the way that is put together where you're sort of using the thing to explain the thing. It's like in process. Thanks. So, I mean, yeah, I'm writing that video and I'm going to, you know, I could, I said my, there are two options. I could go, okay, I could just write about all, write all about how this thing works or I could try to just show it in real time and just do like a real time demo. Um, and that's fun. It's cool. It's fun. It's, it's, it's really satisfying, um, switching views of your own self. <laughs> if that, <laughs> if that makes anything you could tell, you could practically tell like how much fun I'm having in that video. I'm just like three Q bam, switch. Yeah. It feels very All like meta QVC a little bit where you're like selling a thing and like, and it has transitions, and then you transition yourself from one shot to picture another. Picture and picture yourself. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a good video. If you're listening, check it out. Oh, thank you. So uh, just to run down the specs real quickly, it's eight HDMI inputs, correct? No SDI? No SDI. So um, if you... That is a little bit of a bummer. I know. It is such a bummer. So I, I would expect that out of the um, the lower model, just the regular A10 Mini. Sure. It's got four right. HDMIs. That's fine. 
if you're putting, I would rather have, I would much rather have six HDMI's and two SDI's on this thing. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Although I guess their thinking is, hey, if you need SDI, we have other stuff. It's not like they don't make anything that could do most of the same stuff that does feature SDI. Yeah, you know, it seemed, you know, now that now that you make that point, um, they could have said, hey, you know, um, if you're using SDI, you're probably in a professional setting, probably. They, I don't know. That's that's not a great assumption to make, but that's that's maybe what they did. So, but yeah, yeah. eight HDMI switcher, no SDI. Um, it's got two USB Cs, um, and that is for anything from recording to an external drive or connecting to a uh, computer, and that's how you would um, or tethering to a hotspot. Oh, or I didn't consider that. Spot. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. They supported it. Uh, they started supporting it a few firmware updates ago. That's really smart. Yeah, wow, really smart. Wow. Yeah, I like that a lot. Definitely. I that was totally not even. I did a lot of research on this thing, and that that did not even come up at all. That's really smart, though. Well, we'll put it in the next YouTube video. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> certainly. As these come out, I don't know how much more they're going to do, but as these come out, I'm going to do a demo for probably every one. Yeah, and just last two notes on these. One thing I really, really liked about this is you get camera control with Blackmagic cameras. I love it. It's so cool. It's yeah, really, over really HDMI. Great. And talking about uh, satisfaction, um, it's really satisfying pressing the rubber buttons physically and everything. But what's really, really satisfying is controlling your cameras from that camera control panel and just being like, oh, black level is a little off. Boom. Oh, white balance is a tiny little bit this and that and that i'm pretty sure only works with black magic cameras yes yeah um that makes sense so um which is great because i had two i think i had two 4ks in that setup and i could just go right over the camera control panel adjust color exposure black level white balance really really great and the cherry on top is the iso when you record there's a button i think in the top right and it turns red when it's recording to a disc. As long as you're doing that, it'll take all that recorded uh, information from all of your HDMI outputs, and it makes a DaVinci Resolve project file. And it is as easy as dropping that file into DaVinci, and your entire show is there. All of your inputs are synced in the timeline, stacked all on top of each other. It's um, it's it's really a dream if you planned on recording a live streamed event and then uh, editing it afterwards to spruce it up a little bit. It's, it's um, perfection. I'll not do such a professional segue on this one and just go straight into Ali's next pick. The Soundcraft, correct me if I get this very <laughs> impossible name wrong, UI24R. It's so catchy, right? Yeah. For some reason, the I is not capitalized. <laughs> Maybe I just didn't do that in my outline. Sounds no, like, it's not capitalized. Yeah, so it's just U I twenty four R. Right. I is not capitalized in that weird acronym. I like Wi Fi. Wi Fi. I. Oh, why the U? You want me to make something up? The or? lowercase I mean <laughs> Wi Fi in the acronym. I don't know, but that's what I always thought about. <laughs> well, I do know what the twenty four means. It's yeah. a twenty four XLR input audio recorder. Is it right? is twenty four channel. Twenty four channels. But what's really cool about this and let me preface this by saying I am an analog snob. I do not like <laughs> digital stuff when it comes to audio, but it is so amazing. Um, a few years ago, my husband and I were at a concert and someone was controlling the board from an iPad, mm -hmm. just like walking through the crowd. And I remember thinking, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And uh, I'm pretty sure this is what they were using. And so when we found it and started talking about carrying it, I got really, really excited. What I really like about this is it is wireless, so you can just connect to it as a hotspot and then go to the URL uh, or go to the IP address as your URL and it pops up all your settings. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're someplace that has like heavy interference or traffic, you can also do an Ethernet connection without a switch, without a router, without anything. Oh, that's great. So many of these things require a, a Ethernet switch. An IT degree? Yeah, it's a fucking... <laughs> possible to use <laughs> yeah i have an art degree that does me no good with ip stuff most yeah. days anytime you have to look at an ip address that is a nightmare for us for customer service purposes we, it's <laughs> so hard to talk people through anything involving like manual networking it's it's a real bummer uh this one they have the 
IP address written on the back. So if you do have to do a hard wire, awesome. it's right there. But really, it's just essentially a full-sized like board control in a digital control system based off of their, it's not even an app. You don't have to download it. You just go to the website for it and there's all the controls. But it is so easy and straightforward. And as a former audio board operator, I love this. As someone who's terrified of audio, I'm not, I won't even say that I just don't like audio. I'm, I'm actually terrified of, <laughs> of audio most of the time um, using it. What makes it so approachable? Um, I think a big thing is just the R&D that Harman does. It's the mm. brand family. They, uh, like, they have all these resources on their website where you can calculate you know, how much. I'm not even going to go into it. If you want to know audio nerd stuff, go to their website. Um, but on our product page, you can actually go to a simulator of their software. So yeah, I you can, love that. Oh, yeah, cool. I love when people do this. So you can go actually pull it up and know exactly what the controls look like before it's ever in your hand, which is amazing. Yeah, we will link to that for sure. And I'll also say I don't I do not understand why every company doesn't do this. If your menu has more than like six options, just make a little menu simulator. It's not hard. I don't know software development, but it can't be hard. <laughs> I mean, they wrote the software already anyways. Yeah, it's there. You just like turn it into Flash or something. I don't know. <laughs> I guess nobody uses Flash, but whatever. Somebody figure it out. Airy does it, which I love. Um, I can't think of another manufacturer that does this. They did it for the Sony Venice, and I literally learned the entire menu system in an hour before going to this like Venice talk. And then I just got there. I was like, wah, 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 and just like... <laughs> <laughs> and see, that's how it should be. You don't have Absolutely. to do like prep day. Yeah. yeah. You can just familiarize yourself so that when you get it, it doesn't feel as intimidating as just having this thing dropped off on you. Like, all right, well, get it going. Right. So, yeah, we'll we'll link to that if anybody listening to this wants to kind of try out the software before they run this thing. And it's not just a mixer. It will also record to external drives or the computer or a computer if you have a computer plugged in. It has a standard USB-A port. Uh, okay. So you can do like thumb drives and stuff. Um, also, you can go directly into your computer if you need to, but it's kind of hard to promote it as Wi-Fi thing that records to your computer. Yeah, yeah, I would probably just do a thumb drive. Yeah. That makes sense. And uh, any thumb drive is fast enough. I know audio doesn't take up a lot of space, but this is 24 independent channels. All the ones that I've tested, which of course are kind of limited, we don't have a whole bunch of thumb drives, but they've yeah. all worked. I wouldn't necessarily use one that you got from like a convention or something, maybe not a free keychain thumb drive, but anything like SanDisk that is professional enough to use should work data weight, data right. rate wise. Nothing that was given away at like a grocery store because you bought a bag of chips. Right. Not that yeah. one, but also throw that one away. Yes. Yeah. Use something that says SanDisk on it. You should be fine. All right, we'll take a quick break right there. And when we come back, we'll talk about some wireless follow focus options. Want a discount on your next order from Lens Rentals? Head to lensrentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code. As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. All right, I'm going to switch back over to Dom. Uh, And I'm really curious about this one because I have not used it yet, and I really, really want to, the Tilta Nucleus M. And this is a a wireless follow focus. Well, why don't you describe what it is and, you know, your experience with it so far? That was kind of a clunky transition, Ryan. I I don't know if I'm sorry. Can we take that again? Yeah, I'll go back. No. I'm going to take take a mic home and work until 10 o'clock at night. That was meant to be completely... Kidding and on air. That wasn't well. That too late. I took it very seriously. Okay. <laughs> and I really probably would take it home. Or tilt it. <laughs> uh, I no, feel I'm awful. Just All right. Um, yeah, you want to roll that again? <clears throat> <laughs> no, I'm leaving all that in. Uh, okay. Let's go. Goodness. Tilt right. nucleus time. Tilt nucleus M. Um, this one. This one was really cool. So I've obviously this one was something that I've seen on 
Instagram and social media being used a lot. I can I already knew that this was a very favored product amongst ACs and focus pullers and people of the like. And so I was excited to get my hands on it because I I kind of knew I kind of knew I was kind of I was going to really like it like the system. And I didn't know why until I opened it up until I saw the side grips. And that is really really cool. So basically in the Nucleus M kit you get your a uh, hand unit, which has your obviously your big focus wheel and a little iris wheel and a tiny little zoom rocker, uh, just like any other wireless follow focus unit. And then you get two two focus motors that go onto the rails, and then you secure them to your focus and zoom. Of course, what's different about this kit is it comes with two awesome smart side handles. So um, basically, you could rig it up in a shoulder rig, and the side handles that you would normally use you can replace them with the tilta nucleus side handles and then those have dials and uh, rockers on them for focus and zoom which is really really great so you could have a wireless follow focus system as a single operator basically which is really really great so you could just have that smart handle tethered um, to your rig uh, say you have a shoulder rig or something like that. Or actually, I'll give you another um, example. Gimbal adapters. Yes. Mm-hmm. You have time. gimbal adapters for them. Totally. Yes. You're operating the gimbal. You get the little um, bushing sort of gimbal adapter that comes off the side. You have full focus and zoom control on your right or left hand, whatever you want, while operating the gimbal, which is almost, which is usually almost exclusively a two-person thing with um, wireless video coming out uh probably and that's just like a whole nother thing which means you're gonna pay more because you need true zero latency true zero latency you're gonna pay more if you have another crew member on there pay more for the wireless video coming out whatever yeah all all of it big money saver um saves a whole crew member if you want you can fire that guy you hate (laughs) (laughs) no it's really it's really really great and um it has a really, really far range, like farther than you would you would probably ever use. It has a thousand foot bandwidth, um, and I literally tried to test this in real life. But guess what? It's really hard to find test a thousand feet to t- to find a straight thousand foot distance. That's actually where we're around the office, anyways. That was that was a hard thing to do. I guess I could have went to like a really large park or field. So anyways, yeah, um, it, it did not, uh, so I had, I had an FX nine rig with wireless video and the nucleus M kit attached to it. And I found a distance that was about, I think eight, 850 feet. Um, I'd say, and I am going 500 feet perfection, 600 feet. Fine. I'm getting like 700 feet. My video signal is cutting out. And then, <laughs> so I said, man, I should have thought, <laughs> probably should have thought about that. Um, because you know, I got two wireless systems going on here and only one boasts a thousand foot bandwidth. So, um, the other one, even if it said a thousand feet probably wouldn't deliver. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So anyways, I get to approximately 850 feet and, um, I am just blindly focusing. I have one camera that's rolling, obviously 850 feet away from me. And I just said, here we go. Let's, let's focus this thing. And I got back, checked the footage. It was perfectly. I guess I'll never really be able to tell if I was perfectly in sync with what I was in, with what I was seeing, but I, tr- I trust it. It seems yeah. like it seems like it was wasn't jittering or stalling or anything. So, and yeah, I, I like like you mentioned that it's super modular. So yeah, the kit that maybe you rented has both handles, but if you don't need both handles, we have kits that you know just the single handheld wheel and one motor, and we have ones that come with both handles, two motors. You can add a motor if you need to. So you can kind of build it into whatever you need it to be. Yep. uh, Which is handy. And then the left trigger has a record trigger. So if you have something to run, I'm guessing from the motor into the camera. Yeah. If you had like an RS cable for your camera. Yeah. uh, Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So you can run that too. Have you used the Teradek RT, Dom? Yeah. Long long time ago and i and i honestly don't think it was even for a gig or anything professional it was probably testing it back back when i was a tech 
Yeah, that would be its like closest competition uh, between this and the Tilta. Yeah, I'm I'm curious how it like stacks up one versus the other. Yeah, what I will say in comparison to the RT system is these motors are larger. You probably won't have a problem with any clearance or anything, but um, they these are probably the largest focus motors I've I've put on on any rig. Um, I'm pretty sure definitely smaller than DJI's, um, which isn't a great which isn't an amazing system, but those focus motors are really, really small. These are a yeah. little, these are a little clunky. What's really awesome is though, actually you can put the rail adapter in um, a bunch of different orientations. So if your lens is close to your rails or really far, or for some reason, really tallly separated, technical, technical mm-hmm. speaking only. If they're really high up from the rails, uh, you can like really um, extend it like that if you wanted to. And um, that that was definitely not the case with other wireless follow focus motors. Um, so that's really yeah. nice. They got a little display right on there. They have um, a interface and a little menu and screen right on there, which is nice. One thing I meant to mention about those side handles, going back to those, those replace the hand unit. So you you can totally power off the main unit. You can assign the motors to their roles, and you can assign them their speeds and everything all from that side grip. It's not the most amazing menu to use; like the menu is way better in the hand grip. But um, it's kind of cool that you can totally ditch the hand grip uh, like on set and just completely operate these from the side handle. And if you're using wireless follow focus, check this one out, Dom, and let me know. Yep. Um, if you're using wireless follow focus, you'll also need likely a wireless video system. So the next thing we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. Are the new Bolt 4K systems beautiful? I think I kind of stuck the landing. I did that stuck one. The landing, ten out of ten. So okay, Teradek Bolt 4K line. Yeah, this is insane. It just keeps growing. It's unbelievable. We have so it much Teradek stop. stuff, and I'm sh- like, it is impossible to know what works best in which situation. And there's a chance the answer is none of it. Yeah, there are so many different <laughs> things, and they. Uh, all their names are like 4K, LT, Max. It, they're not like evocative of what the thing is. They are. So, okay. So that's really why this is on my list because okay. you are correct that it's not super intuitive when you're looking at it. But seeing as I've had to onboard every single one of these 4Ks and I'm being dramatic on purpose. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the 4K line, even though it seems like it's just a bunch of numbers and letters and whatever, it kind of is. but so 750, 1500, all of that is indicative of the distance it's supposed to be rated in feet. Sorry, it took me a second to make sure I was saying this right. Um, <laughs> LT, so the LT line is going to be limited to 3G, whereas the non-LTs are going to have 12G support. Oh, okay. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask if there was any reason at all to go XT over LT at this point. The LT is a little more compact also, mm-hmm. um, just because obviously 3G is not going to have the same processors as a 12G supported device. Right. Um, And then on the transmitters for the LTE, there's no battery plate because they're just teensy tiny things. Mm -hmm. And so they're designed to be VTAP powered. uh, Okay. Which is kind of nice. And then you have the 4K Max 12G, which is rated for like 3,000 feet. But then when you pair it with the 4K antenna array, it's rated for 5,000 feet. Oh my God. I know. You can also do one transmitter to six receivers. Wow. And everything can be monitored through the app. And everything within the 4K line is intercompatible. Wow. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So if you're using like a 4K 750, it will be compatible with the new LT stuff. Right. And so if you want to send a signal to, say, someone who's pulling focus for you, Mm -hmm. you don't need to pay for the full Mac system. Right. But if you still want to send video off to, say, Video Village that's further away, you can do the same thing and just kind of customize your receivers as necessary to suit oh, whatever you need to do. Brilliant. Yeah, that's brilliant. really helpful because yeah. they used to be very like in their own little ecosystems. Like one wouldn't work with the other if you were doing multiple receivers. Correct. The so previous now, limit was, correct me, three? Four hypothetically, but we only ever recommended three. Receivers? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the 4K line, it's... Uh, kind of overwhelming every time we see a new 4k coming in or get announced it's you kind of want to cry yeah there are so many of them it literally just does not stop the best i can boil it down to is unless you have a 
super intimate familiarity with this Terra deck stuff. If you have a specific setup that you're not sure which Terra deck to order, you should call us. You should pretty much call us if you're ordering a Terra deck. Not that they're difficult to work with. They are not. Once they arrive on set, if you have the thing you need, then it's the easiest wireless video system, especially with that new app, which I checked out. It's so much easier to use than their previous pairing modes. I love the new app. So yes, I can highly recommend this stuff. It's just that there are so many different versions and so many different ways to power them and so many different possible combinations of transmitter and receiver and HDMI and SDI and cross converting and which formats you're using. It's best to probably give us a call and we can kind of talk you through it. Yeah. Even if you've used Teradek products in the past, if you're having trouble with these 4K ones, talk to us because people might not notice or not may not be aware of like all the diagnostic tools available in that app. Yeah, exactly. All right. And what we're going to do is I'm, I'm choosing to wrap up on the one that is probably going to take the longest to talk about. Uh, and that is Dom submitted because he spent a good amount of time making a YouTube video about it. The Ursa 12K. So, Dom, I'm just going to let you start. What has been your experience with the Ursa 12K so far? Well, let me start by saying it's it's kind of only begun. I've really only shot on it, and I haven't got into the post workflow, which is I feel oh, like oh yeah, that's going to be a nightmare. Yeah. Um. So I feel that's also like the major talking point too. Um. I feel like so. Sorry for not being perhaps as prepared about this. I do definitely have. No, that's all right. You only have time to do what you have time to do. Oh, I've had I've had plenty of time to get this into Premiere. I just <laughs> I, I just don't think I I just want to. I said Premiere, but I'm probably going to start it in DaVinci because the research that I've done so far really makes it seem like it's much the 12K video workflow is much better optimized in DaVinci, which obviously makes sense because that's Blackmagic's editing program. So. We'll see. On their products page, it literally says, uh, I don't have it up anymore, but it's like 12K video, edited on a laptop. Edited on a 400 degree laptop. Yeah, right. An absolutely scorching hot laptop with the top of the line specs. You know, it it doesn't really have to be the top of the line specs. What you're really going to find is your project resolution is going to be the big determination there. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you're in a 4K project uh it's it's probably going to play fine as long as you drop the compression down to one fourth or one eighth it'll probably run pretty smooth if you try to run 30 seconds straight of 12k you know uh, it'll probably get pretty choppy once again i haven't actually done any of this what i can tell you is i just shot a couple of things today kept the recording times very very short because i knew these file sizes were going to be enormous And I plugged it in and I shot 350 gigs. And I promise you, I did not shoot a lot. This is just like (laughs) this morning and today. And my jaw like dropped. I was like, that says 35 gigs, right? Right. And that's because we're not just talking about 12K ProRes. One of the major things about this camera, one of the major differences between, you know, beyond resolution between this and the standard Ursa's is that this will only record uh, black magic raw is that right there are no compressed you know video codecs on here no only black magic raw so if you're used to shooting in prores on other black magic cameras that's not an option on the ursa mini pro 12k and you know i have mixed feelings about that because i, I do feel like black magic raw is going to be the best way you're go- is going to be the way to get the best image out of this camera although over the past uh like year or so i've sort of this is sort of my stance on Blackmagic Raw. It's it's delicate. You really got to get everything right. And so, and I've experienced this with the pocket cameras. I really don't think they look great unless you've really sufficiently um, lit that image and your scopes are in the right place and you got your white balance in the right place. It's it's pretty it's a pretty delicate um, thing to get right, in my opinion. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. So I'm not. I'm not very, very optimistic about working with the 12K. It's especially weird that all of this work we're talking about is toward the goal of 12K resolution, which I don't know if you are sold. I'm not really sold on the necessity of 12K as a recording format. 
you should have watched the product launch because Grant Petty would have made you I'm, really excited I'm about sure it. sure Grant Petty is sold on the they necessity of 12 They started with an image this size format. and then they zoomed out and then they oh, yeah. zoomed out and then they zoomed out and were like 12K. Yeah. I mean, for certain things, I'm sure it is helpful. Like if I were shooting a nature documentary, maybe. But then you're you're saying, well, if we're capturing in 12K, we need 10 more drives than we would normally use. I don't know. It, Dom, is there a situation where you think 12K is practically useful? That is Five what years from now. Yeah, <laughs> decent. Yeah, very. So that's kind of that's basically um, that's kind of funny. That's like sort of where my answer is headed. But that's what my video topic is on this week. Um, I'm, I'm doing a strictly topical video this week about like how many K's do we need? Pretty sure that's what I'm going to call it. Like, is 12K too much? Is it too early to start the discussion about exporting an 8K? Um, is that is that is it is it too early? You know, there's the reframing argument, right? You can get nine 4K images out of that 12K image size. That is insane. So here's kind of like how it progressed, right? So 1080 is the standard for a while, and then 4K comes out, and now we're using 4K to deliver better 1080. And then a couple of years trickle on, and now 4K is like kind of like the standard now. And now we have now we're using 8K to deliver better 4K. So if you follow the progression, are we going to start using 12K to deliver in 8K? And is it too early to be starting that conversation? Black Magic Design says no. Clearly, I I mean I think I said it about 4K when we were still in HD. It'll be here sooner than you think. Mm-hmm said the same thing about 8k especially like on a consumer level it's hard for people to convince themselves that these upgrades are necessary but you know in a professional context when you're working with video you really do have to keep up with it even if it means changing all of your hardware and changing all your cables and you know right a never-ending cycle of new certifications and standards and and i guess even super excited grant petty wouldn't necessarily say everybody tomorrow including like your wedding videographer needs to start shooting 12K. It's there as an option if you need it. And it works, apparently. I mean, we haven't had any issues with the 12K. Yeah, and I I don't know. I don't, I'm not aware of anything broadcasting in 8K at this point, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I'm sure the Olympics somewhere in some yeah <laughs> experimental broadcast yep. will be shooting some things in 8K. I'm sure. So yeah, if you're shooting 12K for an 8K finish, I guess it's it's there if you need it. The and option exists. That's what exists. they promoted it as heavily when they first announced it was 12K for 8K masters, basically. Right, and yeah, we don't have time here to go into why that's necessary, <laughs> but there are plenty of reasons why shooting in a higher resolution than you're planning on delivering is helpful for mosaicing and color fringing and all all this. Uh, niche stuff that we're not going to talk about, but, but Grant Petty does. Yeah, Grant Petty will cover it, and we'll <laughs> we'll link to some talks. I'm sure Grant Petty's TED Talk. But yeah, it is like if you're going to finish an 8K, if you're going to spend that money, you may as well spend the money to shoot in 12K uh, for that finish. And I, I guess and melt this, your computer. Yes, this is here for you. <laughs> well, by the time this episode comes out, that video will be done. So there will be an update there for anybody who's curious. And, yes, there you know, will. All, all the information you discovered. There will be two. Uh, from your 12K experience. Yeah, there will be two 12K videos. So you'll get to see one 12K video where I'm like half optimistic, like, hey, I don't know what to expect. Haha. And then the next one, I'll probably just be disheveled and and <laughs> lost sleep with bags under my eyes. In the morning in your basement. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, what's up, everybody? I'm back with the 12K. Well, we'll we'll link to both versions. Happy Dom and Sad Dom. Messaging with Allie at 10 p.m. as I'm re-recording this intro. (laughs) Uh, Oh, goodness. So, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll link to those videos for anybody who's curious. Um, You can check them out. And that is it for Rodeo. Yeehaw, guys. It's done. I don't know what you say at the end of a rodeo. Uh, Usually you get, like, carried out by an ambulance, right? mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. I would like to say, I wanted to say this at the beginning. I say in real life, Howdy and y'all all the time and up here in Massachusetts. And I think I purposefully don't say that to my coworkers in Tennessee because I don't want to feel like I'm trying too hard to like to <laughs> because you know, it, yeah, it fit would in. maybe seem condescending. I know. It, it might also sound a little rude, you know. So I say y'all to people like in Australia all the time and they think it is a 
adorable. Oh, I, bet. <laughs> yeah. I don't use it very often. I should. Yeah, it's it's a it's the most. I don't know why everybody doesn't use y'all. It's, it's so great. efficient. It's, it just rolls off the tongue. Yeah, I mean, the English language doesn't have a collective plural. There is no collective plural. That isn't gendered. Like, I could say you guys or whatever, but yeah, y'all is the only word we have for that. Well, you could say you all, which is... Well, yeah, just just go inversion. through all that trouble. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. You can just throw in a Two whole an words? Yeah, I'm just throwing an apostrophe in there. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, good great. rodeo, y'all. Yep. Howdy. <laughs> that sounds so unnatural. <laughs> good <laughs> rodeo, y'all. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. Every product we covered here will be linked to in the show notes, and you can find a lot more information about any of them on our product pages. If you need help putting together an order, feel free to email us at support at lensrentals.com or give us a call at 901-754-9100. For anyone curious about the Ursa 12K, we'll also include a link to both of Dom's finished videos, where you can see what he thought after some more time with the camera. As always, make sure to visit lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We are on Instagram and Twitter at lensrentals. And thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast, I'll be way out of my depth talking to our optical experts, Roger and Aaron, about MTF testing. That's the relatively complicated and very technically involved process we use to get an idea of what sort of optical performance we can expect from different lenses. Hear me figure it out as I go on the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast.